Good afternoon. It's my uh, great pleasure and privilege to welcome you to Florida State University and this symposium uh, on the occasion of the transition from of the 50th anniversary, the change and transition from Florida State College for Women to the Florida State University. As many of you know, there will be uh, many celebrations this month and next. Uh, the College of Arts and Sciences uh, decided, thanks to an idea formulated by Professor Leon Golden, to invite our distinguished guests here as uh, our contribution to that celebration. And we were, of course, delighted uh, when they were able to be with us. Those of us who've been uh, honored to hear the previous um, presentations know that you are in for a, a tremendous treat this afternoon, uh, both uh, intellectually uh, as well as um, spiritually, and it's, um, it's just been a marvelous symposium so far. On behalf of the students, the faculty, and the friends of Florida State University, uh, I want to thank you all for coming here. To introduce our speaker this afternoon, uh, let me introduce Professor Janet Burroway, a professor of English and one of the distinguished members of the faculty at Florida State University. Dr. Burroway. A couple of weeks ago, I was at a little college called Erskine in the township of Due West, South Carolina, which is a town so small that it literally does not have a traffic light. And the son of my, the 17 year old son of my host was carrying around a dog-eared copy of Cat's Cradle. I asked him if he was reading it for a course and he said no, but a guy I know had to read it for a course and he told me I said, should check it out. So I asked him what he thought of it and he said exactly as we did in the 60s, cosmic cool. <laughs> I tried to remember the last time a 17 year old had said of a 70-year-old that he was cool, let alone cosmic. And I thought that when my generation says, Mr. Vonnegut has partly formed the way we think about the world, well, we grew up with him. But when his books leap a couple of generations into the backpacks of the kids in the boondocks, then it must mean that his way of looking at the world has a certain staying power. I told Marley Crenshaw that Vonnegut was coming to Tallahassee in a couple of weeks and that I would get to meet him. But name dropping doesn't cut much ice in Due West, South Carolina. And Marley said, oh yeah? Cool. Tell him hi from me. <laughs> Here in Tallahassee, we are a metropolis of over 100,000 souls and we have a lot of traffic lights. And the tickets to this event were grabbed up in less than an hour. So if I say that Mr. Vonnegut needs no introduction, what that means is that an introduction is just a public way of saying hi. Here's what you already know about Kurt Vonnegut. Player piano, the sirens of Titan, Mother Night, Cat's Cradle, God bless you Mr. Rosewater, Slaughterhouse Five, Breakfast of Champions, Slapstick, Dead Eye Dick, Galapagos, Bluebeard, Hocus Pocus, Happy Birthday, Wanda Jane, Wanda June. Here's what you probably know. That films were made not only of Slaughterhouse-Five, but also Slapstick, Happy Birthday, Wanda June, and the short stories, Who Am I This Time, and DP. That God Bless You, Mr. Rosewater was adapted for the stage, and that the film of Mother Night opens tonight at the Miracle. You may also know, partly if you read your brochure, that Vonnegut was born in Indianapolis and studied biochemistry at Cornell and anthropolo anthrop anthropology at University of Chicago, that he was in the infantry during the Second World War and a POW through the bombing of Dresden, that he's lectured at the Writer's Workshop at Iowa, Harvard, and CUNY, that he's been called a satirist, a black humorist, a fantasist, a postmodernist, a confessional exorcist, and has from the beginning treated science fiction as a literary art and dramatized the futility of trying to change the world. Here's what you might not know, that Vonnegut is the father of seven children, three biological and four adopted, including three of his sisters, a talented sculptor who died of cancer at the age of 41. 
that his brother is an important and innovative meteorologist, and that Vonnegut has said that, the, that his main paradoxical literary themes were best expressed by these two siblings. His brother, who shortly after the birth of his first child wrote to him, here I am cleaning shit off of practically everything, <laughs> and his sister, whose last words were, no pain. Please join me and Marley Crenshaw of Due West, South Carolina, in saying hi to Kurt Vonnegut. Thank you. Thank you. Is Jim Denenny in the audience? Jim, would you please come up here? And Leon, would you get the hell out of that chair and let Jim sit there? <laughs> Good, you sit over there, Jim. Yeah, Jim and I uh, were both captured in the Battle of the Bulge, and we were both prisoners in Dresden. Uh, we were privates. Uh, under the Geneva Convention, privates are required to work for their keep, and so we weren't kept in funny camps out in the countryside. We were part of, we were slave laborers in Dresden. And uh, there's a very convenient number, there were a hundred of us, and the normal experience of prisoners of war in Germany, German hands uh, was 3% died. And three of our guys died, so we were uh, <coughs> perfectly average. Uh, Jim, have you seen any of the other t lectures? Because there's... Uh, yeah. Good. Uh, Pete, uh, Ramon, was the uh, yeah. No, but these two guys, did you hear Heller or what's the, what the other no, guys no, talk? No. <laughs> <laughs> you gotta you, you, you gotta speak uh Craigiska for me. <laughs> well anyway, is the three of us are very friendly and uh they are moved to be friendly with Jim and one benefit of having been a soldier, sailor, airman whatever, is you become a brother of anyone in any army in the world and feel entitled to speak to them. I think that the warmth the three of us feel for each other is that we all went through the soldier thing in time of war. And uh, if any sort of enemy, if a German enemy, a former German enemy, or a Japanese enemy or whatever, they'd be pals, they'd be brothers, and we'd feel closer to them than we do to Newt Gingrich. <laughs> uh, and I'm, Marvel is our, uh, I, I guess you all know about our new ambassador to Vietnam. Is this guy was a prisoner of theirs for six years. Jim and I were prisoners for what, four and a half, five months, I guess. It was five, six? We, we were in the same war? <laughs> Anyway, uh, I'm the only, I, th I think that the other speeches are very good, but none of them address the title of the symposium, which was metaphor, and I, I just, as my speech is just metaphor, 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 is because nobody else has talked about it at all. Uh, I want to say that this is an anniversary. This is the 60th anniversary of a very interesting event. Uh, 60 years ago, uh, there was a civil war going on in Spain. World War II had not begun yet. The Germans had chosen sides during that war in Spain, that civil war. And their air force bombed a little town, about 10,000 people, called Guernica. This was so horrifying that the Germans were, the Nazis were revealed to be so subhuman to bomb a city like this. Now their point was that they were going to make so, to war seem so terrible that everybody would say, all right, let's just quit. Uh, and <coughs> Pablo Picasso that same year, 1937, 
painted a picture as famous as Whistler's mother or the Mona Lisa or Van Gogh's sunflower. It's a Guernica. Well, all right, that was 60 years ago, as we have come away since then. <clears throat> my speech begins here, that Freeman Dyson is a native of England my age. He is a physicist at the Institute for Advanced Studies at Princeton nowadays, and I'm whatever it is I've become. We are now 74 years old, God help us. On February 13, 1945, we were 22. The Second World War in Europe was winding down back then. German armies were in, were in retreat on all fronts. In two and a half months, Germany, which lay in ruins, would surrender unconditionally. The date on which I ask you to focus again so long ago, February 13, 1945. Freeman Dyson, 22 years old, was then a uniformed office worker for the Royal Air Force in England. I was a captured American soldier, as was Jim, a private, a slave laborer in Dresden, Germany. That night, February 13, 1945, the Royal Air Force burned Dresden to the ground with the greatest man-made firestorm in history, killing 135,000 men, women, and children. That is more people than were killed at Hiroshima. In my book, as I made, Amer I, was, I was writing my book for American audience, and so I made it seem more of an American event than a British. It was, in fact, a British uh, atrocity as they, they came over at night and set all the fires, and we simply uh, bombed during the daylight to sort of help. Uh, now many years later, I corresponded with Freeman Dyson. I'd reviewed his book, Disturbing the Universe, which I'd liked a lot. And he already knew that I had survived the Dresden firestorm because of my book, Slaughterhouse-Five. And he told me of the minor clerical part uh, which he had played in its planning and execution. Just an office worker, you know, keeping the planes in the air or whatever. He I asked him <coughs> if he had any idea why all those civilians had been killed and why such a beautiful city without war industries, without air raid shelters, and with the war almost over in any case, had been turned to ashes and stones. He said it was purely bureaucratic momentum. What are we going to do tonight? <laughs> now the war, remember, had been going on for England for nearly five years, and huge organizations had come into being there, and here too, essentially corporations whose business day after day, month after month, it was to wreak havoc on Germany and its allies. They were not meticulous. <clears throat> they were not, these bureaucrats were not meticulously supervised, could not have been meticulously supervised by the great leaders on our side, Winston Churchill, Del Franklin Delano Roosevelt, and, and Joseph Stalin, God help us. The effectiveness of such leaders in wars which cannot be finally settled for years and years depends on their delegation of most life and death decisions to well-chosen subordinates. The chief executive of the bomb-dropping division of the Royal Air Force was Sir Arthur Travers Harris, nicknamed Bomber Harris. And there came a day when there was nothing more for the employees of Bomber Harris to do unless they wanted to bomb Dresden, an untouched city of no military significance, so they bombed it. Now, I've said before that every, it, to every sort of audience in many parts of the world that the destruction of Dresden, as important in the history of music and architecture and art patronage as Vienna or Budapest or Prague, did not free a single <coughs> death camp prisoner a microsecond earlier didn't cause a single German soldier to stop fighting a microsecond earlier. I've gone further declaring that only one human being on the whole face of the earth, think of this, benefited from the fire bombing of Dresden. I am that person. I got five dollars for every person killed. <laughs> Nobody else has come forward. <laughs> to claim any benefit at all. You didn't get anything out of it, did you, Jim? No. <laughs> Those who argue with me when I say such things don't do so in military terms. They do so with a literary device, with a metaphor. 
They use one word or phrase as analogous to another one. The firebombing of Dresden, they say, one way or another, was a lesson for the Germans. We've all been to school, we all know what a lesson is. Now I'm reminded of a man who was about to be electrocuted in the Cook County Jail in Chicago during the 1930s. They strapped him into the electric chair and asked him if he had anything to say, and he said, yes, this will certainly teach me a lesson. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? <laughs> Our Air Force was involved, incidentally, but in a supporting role, as I say, dropping high explosives during the daytime. It was the Brits in the nighttime who burned the city down. Ah, that they didn't teach me a lesson while I were at it is a miracle. They tried to teach Jim a lesson, too. If the raid had been as successful as they hoped it, we'd both be dead. Uh, Jim, incidentally, is a fellow Floridian. Yeah, he lives in Craw Crawfordsville. And, uh, Jim, you say amen ever so often, all right? When I tell war stories. <laughs> well, the big amen was when we got a direct hit on, our, on the slaughterhouse. Remember? No. The, don't you remember that? <laughs> <laughs> you was out of it. <laughs> To extend the metaphor of bombing civilian populations as education, uh, Jim and I attended a class there in Dresden after the firestorm, uh, and it required stu us as students uh, to dig corpses out of ordinary cellars. As again, as I've said, there were no air raid shelters in Dresden when we carried the remains of human beings suffocated and s then we <coughs> carried the remains of human beings to cellars to enormous funeral pyres in the middle of the city and the, the, all these bodies had to be burned uh, as soon as possible for aesthetic and also sanitary reasons now some were bodies <coughs> must have been bodies of captives like ourselves and poles or yugoslavs brits australians or new zealanders or whatever and bodies of wounded German soldiers or refugees from the Eastern Front. The Germans had hoped, by keeping the city supposedly unworthy of attack, to have a haven for their refugees and their wounded and sick. When Jim and I were dealing <coughs> so intimately with corpses in the ruins of Dresden, it would have been hard for us to think, let alone to say, as though we <coughs> had only read of the firestorm in a newspaper back home, we didn't feel or think in dealing with these corpses. I hope you've turned your, learned your lesson, you dirty rats. It serves you right. Now, when we got back to the United States, I asked another war buddy, now dead, per Private Bernard V. O'Hare, what he learned, if anything. He said he learned not to believe everything his government said anymore. Here was a lie we had been told. Our enemies bombed civilian populations, whereas our side did not. Our side had bomb sites which were incredibly accurate, so we dest destroyed only military targets as much as possible, leaving their surroundings unharmed. We saw for ourselves it simply wasn't true. The planes were coming over and letting go of their loads on, on cities in general. The aiming point in Dresden, I think, was the soccer stadium. When you saw the soccer stadium, you let go, <laughs> go of the bombs. Well, that was supposedly a big difference between us and our inhuman, inhuman enemies. At the beginning of World War II and before our country got into it, and when I hadn't even graduated from high school yet, the Germans bombed civilian populations in Spain and then in Holland and then in England simply to be terrifying to demoralize those who oppose them. Our side, basically the democratic societies of the United States and England and the British Commonwealth, would never behave that heartlessly. But by the end of the war, as those of us who were in Dresden and saw firsthand, obliterating whole cities with no particular targets in mind, had for our side, for the good guys, become perfectly ordinary, a logical thing to do. When I was on furlough, still, when I was home on furlough but still in the army, our side, the good guys, 
obliterated Hiroshima and then Nagasaki uh, with atomic bombs. I would later meet a Japanese gentleman, in fact my publisher there, who was a schoolboy playing soccer in Hiroshima when the first atomic bomb was dropped. He had chased a ball into a ditch. There was a flash when he came back out of the ditch. His schoolmates, his family, his house and his school and his town were gone. Served him right. Now, a metaphor for what we were doing with atomic bombs? We were trampling on the vineyards where the grapes of wrath were stored. <clears throat> now, we were giving a bully a taste of his own medicine, getting revenge for his cowardly attack on Pearl Harbor. We were slaying a dragon. <clears throat> to see the reality of bombing civilians sanitized, even glorified by such metaphors, however, as Jim and I <clears throat> Denini and I did on the ground at Dresden, is to make one mistrustful of language, to say the very least. And our foreign policy and that of every other nation armed with atom and hydrogen bombs, France, India, Israel, Britain, China, Russia, South Africa, is easily justified by yet another metaphor. You mess with us, we'll give you a bloody nose so fast your head will swim. Yes, and every nation with such a capability has a large number of persons coming to work every day, earning their livings by being perpetually ready to bring about the total destruction of vast areas of the planet, of millions of human beings, no questions asked. <clears throat> Should that seem, under the circumstances, to make good sense? It was seriously suggested that we use atomic weapons at the start of our participation in the Vietnam War. Why not? Why did we develop such weapons in the first place if we weren't prepared to use them? Debates continue to the present day about whether or not we should have dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima out of respect for my friend Bill Styron, <coughs> who, as he has told you, was a Marine getting ready to land on the Japanese mainland when the bomb was dropped. I agree that Hiroshima bomb may have saved the lives of thousands and thousands of American fighting men as Bill and I were <clears throat> later on at a pen convention in Tokyo, and uh, I was faded as a person who had been some through something horrible, you know, like the firebombing of Dresden, sort of equivalent to the atomic bombing of Hiroshima. And uh, I was invited to go down to Hiroshima, to the war memorial there, and say something pious. I refused to go. Uh, because, well, as Bill said today, is, is I felt the story over there was that there, there were these talented island people who were suddenly attacked by us. And uh, anyway, there are those who say we needn't have bombed Hiroshima, that the Japanese, <coughs> with their Navy and Air Force gone, were trying to find peace, some, trying to find some way to surrender. They would have surrendered and scrapped all pans, plans to defend their homelands even if we hadn't dropped the bomb. We will never know. And so that <coughs> that debate will go on forever. And I had no idea that uh, Bill Styron was going to cover this subject so eloquently and so correctly earlier today. But then we dropped a bomb on Nagasaki, which gained us nothing. The war was surely over by then. But we had this second bomb, which had cost a lot of money to build. Because there it was, and it worked sure as hell. So what the heck? Why waste it? Let's drop it. So they did. And uh, there you have bureaucratic momentum as an engine of war again. What can we do today? There's that bomb sitting <laughs> over there. About Dresden once more, about February 13, 1945. The raid was scarcely reported in this country. The, said, the paper said simply that Allied planes had attacked Dresden and suffered loss, light losses, nothing unusual. But England, in England, even before the raid, <clears throat> there were debates in the House of Commons about the practicality of making German cities uninhabitable. Our side had to occupy those cities and go shelter and electricity and working water and sewer systems and passable streets and so forth after we took them over. 
Uh, there were many people in England, moreover, who had traveled or worked all over Europe in peacetime and had come to love old cities as art treasures, as marvels of human history, which belonged to everybody, no matter what their political situation at any given moment. Few Americans in those days had any reason to feel that way. Not many of us had had good times or interesting times in Europe, the museums, the cathedrals, the restaurants, the romantic bridges, the grand hotels. English persons were also Europeans, and so are likely to feel their world diminished by the loss of any beautiful city or town on the mainland. Uh, <clears throat> there was a Dresden, incidentally, long before there was such a nation as Germany, just as there was a Venice long before there was such a nation as Italy. And Italy, lest it be forgotten, was among our enemies during World War II. Think of what a few bombs might have done to Venice. Would have served them right, and they asked for it. So did Florence and Rome. Now, to this very day, there are many persons, many of them war veterans, who feel that the indiscriminate leveling of cities by bombers was disgraceful, proving that we were as heartless as the worst of the Nazis. There is more than one way to incinerate human beings in industrial quantities. The people who worry about it were the Brits, not the Americans. Now, the British, moreover, had learned from the Nazis bombing of their own cities that such atrocities didn't make the survivors want to surrender. It made them even more determined to go on fighting. Now, after the war, moreover, it was learned that the bombings of German cities did little to slow down their weapons production. This was amazing. Uh, the armaments industry of the Nazis was decentralized with numerous small plants hard to identify and hidden well away from centers of population. They went on making tanks and planes and everything else right up to the very end. Now, Sir Arthur Travers Harris, Bomber Harris, an enthusiast for the leveling of cities by the Royal Air Force and by our Air Force as well, died of natural causes in 1984 at the age of 92. It was proposed that he be immortalized by a statue in London, which has in fact since been erected. But this honor was strongly opposed by many of his country persons, who still felt that wholesale killing of civilians in the wrecking of cities, a thousand years or more in the making, for little and no perceptible military advantage, was nothing to be proud of. Yet another metaphor. They were chicken-hearted. In any case, life is cheap, and I thank you for your attention. And Jim, you come up here and help answer all the questions about our heroism. It, uh, <laughs> I'll say this, uh, talking about metaphors, uh, Jim and I feel we were bait in a trap is our Green Division was sent to defend supposedly a quiet front. How many miles did we, were we supposed to defend, Jim? Do you remember? Uh, I don't, 75 many, miles. Something, yeah. 15,000 men, never been in battle before, sent to <laughs> defend 75,000 miles. We didn't have proper winter gear. We had practically no ammunition. What was your specialty, Jim? Uh, I was an ammunition handler. Yeah, well, you'd know if we had any, wouldn't, wouldn't you? Well, uh, <laughs> I remember the last three boxes, and a, a big old line sergeant come with tears in his eyes asking for ammunition. And I, these three boxes was for another outfit that was right beside him that needed the ammunition also. So at that moment, uh, when we, the only am ammunition we had was what we... Uh, was come over from Camp Atterbury with. Everything else, there was no other, other uh, ammunition. Yeah, and so the Germans, of course, attacked us with of, of tanks and everything else. I didn't see a single American tank or airplane. Yeah. I, saw, I, I saw one American tank track. Uh, that's where we was uh, in our tents, sleeping in the snow there, and then come up to our tent the tracks did, and then backed away. <laughs>
But anyway, we were very lightly armed, very lightly equipped. Uh, the Germans had white capes. We were fighting in the snow, or, you know, being killed in the snow, or being chased in the snow. And uh, the Germans were, had white capes, and the American uniforms, as you know, are the color of dog shit. And <laughs> <laughs> you know how easily that shows up on the, on the snow. <laughs> But anyway, the Germans did take the bait. It was what? Our division lost, well, lost two regiments, and the divisions on our flanks each lost a regiment. I think four regiments in all were wiped out uh, because there weren't nearly enough of us to hold against this huge attack, which was supposedly unexpected, but I think it was expected. And it was the last big thrust of the Germans, and they kept on going, and uh, then we're finally cut off as all the guys who broke through us uh, were finally killed or captured because they kept on going and should have stopped. Anyway, uh, my sort of writing is, my sort of novels have been generally different from Mr. Styron's and Mr. Heller's in that they've been more journalistic. I've reported I started out to be a reporter. I thought that's what I was going to be as a journalist. And, and so I was going to be a writer of some kind. And uh, so uh, when I wrote about Dresden, I was reporting something I had seen. When I, my first novel was Player Pianos, I saw the first experiments with automation at General Electric in Schenectady, where I was a p public relations guy. And so I wrote, and essentially, in novel form, reported on the implications of having machines better employees than human beings, and so forth. I nonetheless respect what they do, too. Uh, the process that we will follow is as a uh, process we followed before. I'm going to um, turn to our two other visiting writers to see if they want to comment on uh, Mr. Monica's talk, and then I will turn to our discussion panel. Uh, your programs contain brief biographical sketches of them. Uh, Martin Rhoda, Janet Burway, uh, Major Gregory Moore, uh, Audrey Wilson, Kevin Herbert and Helen Wallace to my left here. And then uh, we will turn to the audience and uh, have some time for questions from the audience. Uh, I will first turn to uh, Mr. Styron and Mr. Heller to see if they want to respond at all to Mr. Uh, I was a very impressive talk, despite your disclaimers. Uh, I thought it was <laughs> extremely well done. And uh, it left me with a lot of residual thought about uh, something that uh, we, we touched upon this morning, uh, which is the um, where does responsibility begin in the uh, in the uh, molestation and ultimately the um, the destruction of civilians. I, I, at risk of repeating something I said this morning, I suppose it won't matter, will it, if I <laughs> mentioned the fact that um, Kurt Vonnegut was talking about this like, unbelievable atrocity of the destruction of Dresden, unprecedented uh, in modern times. Uh, Joe Heller pointed out that the killing of uh, privately, that the killing of civilians is an ancient habit, that the Bible is filled with uh, episodes of the destruction of uh, civilians, as is uh, a lot of the literature of antiquity, but that in modern times, uh, up until World War II, uh, civilians were off limits. You can comb the uh, literature of the Civil War, that most horrible of wars, and uh, you will find virtually no 
uh, descriptions of any uh, real harm to civilians, isolated cases to be sure, and, and occasionally uh, uh, a situation in which maybe a single civilian was uh, mistreated badly, but that the idea of civilians being harmed was almost sacrosanct. The Franco-Prussian War uh, it was a similar event. Uh, that was uh, next to the Civil War was the largest 19th century conflagration. And you find uh, that civilians are off limits. Uh, you then proceed to World War I, uh, where the same situation applied. Uh, there were random stories of the Germans uh, uh, famously uh, uh, butchering Belgian children. This turned out to be uh, a fantasy. It was not true. It was propaganda on the part of the Allies. Civilians, once again, were off limits. Um, the critical moment came when Kurt uh, mentioned Guernica. And this is an interesting proposition, the idea that the uh, first recorded moment uh, in strictly modern history of the uh, harming of civilians was at Guernica. And then after that comes this extraordinary uh, uh, acceleration of the slaughter of civilians. Uh, after Guernica comes the firebombings of London, Manchester, Coventry, and our retaliation in, um, in, in kind in Dresden. And then, of course, the extraordinary firebombings of the Japanese mainland, Nagoya, Kobe, Tokyo, where hundreds of thousands were destroyed and culminating, of course, in the, in the most famous of all destruction of innocent people being Hiroshima and Nagasaki. I'm merely bringing this up uh, as food for thought because I think it is a fascinating component of our modern history that, uh, that whereas uh, soldiers and sailors were often at each other's throats, uh, ever since the Middle Ages, people who we have come to call civilians have not been uh, objects of, of firepower and destruction. And I'd like to, uh, I'm bringing this up because I, th I think that possibly it might be a food for thought uh, in a few minutes when we uh, throw open the conversation to uh, a general overview. One of the appalling elements in Mr. Vonnegut's speech was that no consideration was given to the possibility that American prisoners of war were in the city at that time. But I think I may be mistaken. I, more probably the question was raised and the answer was, so what? And they went ahead with the mission. There was, a, there was, along with displaying a Red Cross on top of a hospital so that wouldn't be bombed, prisoner of war encampments were supposed to be marked with orange and black stripes. Nobody did it. Because they did mark the hospitals, but they never marked that. And uh, Jim and I have been attacked by every Air Force but the German. We <laughs> including the Russian and uh, what we did survive in, in, my, in Slaughterhouse 5 we were very lucky we were able to survive the bomb, bombing because we were in a, in a meat locker way under the street and, there's, and uh, it was an ideal shelter but anyway, after we came out and we were walking across this moonscape to get to the edge of town to where life began and on, a couple of American fighter planes peeled off and, and uh, figured we looked like bad guys and <laughs> had fired at us. And then when the war was over, uh, and we'd, it was a long time before we'd get back to our own lines, we were in the Russian zone. Uh, we were wandering around and Russian planes would peel off 
and open up on us and, and uh, flying P-39s, which are, whose engines are made in my hometown of Indianapolis. It was very painful. <laughs> I'm going to turn to the uh, discussion panel now. And then take some questions. Uh, uh, Professor Herbert. What specific themes in, your, in all your work do you think especially speak to our younger generation on the threshold of their own maturity and careers? Don't believe anyone over 30, <laughs> <laughs> except me. <laughs> Uh, uh, Mark, do you want to respond to that? Uh, <clears throat> well, I think the message of any uh, strong book, good book, uh, to a reader is you are not alone. Other people feel as you do. Yes, yes. <laughs> and there are a lot of lonely people out there who, who are not nourished by popular entertainment or even maybe by the advice of their stupid parents or whatever and uh, <laughs> so so uh, I hope good books uh, let young people figure things out for themselves and to know hey I got a friend somewhere else uh, please uh, Mark Gottlieb Mark Gottlieb uh, Mark in England at the time there was little in the papers, but many rumors. And one we wanted very much to believe, and which I heard repeated by a German professor who was at FSU when I came, who was a teenager at the time on a train outside, outside Dresden. Mm. This rumor was that the Britons and the Americans didn't want to bomb Dresden, but it was Stalin's price for a peace fire in revenge for Stalingrad. I heard this in England, I heard this from a German. Uh, is, do you know, have you heard about that? I didn't know Stalin, so I, <laughs> I'm <laughs> able to test it. I have no idea. That would be at a very high level conversation. I don't know. It's, I, I know. Uh, I think there must have been a lot of spin stories put out about why this happened. And again, I think it was a bureaucracy saying, saying what are we going to do today? is I think Churchill himself must have been dismayed as a world historian and appreciator of European culture in general. Uh, must have been very sad to have the RAF burn down this wedding cake city, which in fact belongs to all of us. We had understood that Heidelberg and Dresden were like Oxford and Cambridge, that they wouldn't be bombed. Yeah, and I... And, uh, I'd, Goodness, I have no idea, it, but what Freeman Dyson said, you know, the clerk there in the office is, is where they were ordering the amount of fuel and, and doing whatever it is, you get the bombers in the air. He said it was simply coming to work. <laughs> what are we going to do today? Is he, and he, yeah. You know, I'd like to add a footnote about this horrible destruction of these glorious European cities. It's well documented now that the city that many of us including myself, love beyond all hope or passion, even more than one loves women, I'm talking about Paris, came within an inch of being flattened. And that fascinatingly enough, it was a German general, his name escapes me at the moment, who was solely responsible for countermanding Hitler's orders and preserved Paris. Was that who it was? Thank you. Uh, at any rate, we have this gentleman uh, who must be accounted among the noble Germans uh, for the fact that uh, we're still able to get an Air France flight and go to the most beautiful city on earth. Uh, in connection with, uh, with the comment of, uh, justifying or explaining the bombing of Dresden. I said, I've never heard that before. I've never seen it in print or heard anything about it. I have read a great deal about the attitudes of the, the British Air Force and the American Air Force in Britain at that time of the war. 
the term that I've read was being on station, which meant that they had the capability there, they had the equipment, they had the men, and they had to find, or wanted to find targets to use it. And Dresden was one that became appealing to this British airman n named Bomber Harris, uh, who I believe was the only man of a certain rank in the English forces who was not given an honor after the war. He was not given the VC. Yeah. Not given the VC. And the second thing I read was that because of his night raids, of a thousand bomber night raids, uh, some 50,000 British airmen were lost in those raids by Bomber Harris. Served him right. <laughs> <laughs> Jim, Jim has some spin. Uh, my friend Danini here has a spin on why Dresden was bombed. Uh, the, one of the things that's, that's different about the, uh, if looking back and during the time is that uh, if you're going to decimate a people, uh, the only thing to do is to kill the women and children. Because there's not a man around has ever had a baby. And uh, so uh, I feel as though that the part of the Dresden bit into the firebomb and then the Hiroshima's and stuff like this was just part of the basic gut instinct to, to destroy a culture. Mm -hmm. And you destroy it by uh, uh, destroying their reproductive uh, uh, mm -hmm. processes. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, oh, let me give Kevin Herbert a chance to... Just a note uh, that you should all be aware of. In the Pacific Campaign, Kyoto, the most important cultural monument in the whole of the Japanese mainland, was stricken from the list at the insistence of uh, Ambassador Gru and others in the Chief of Staff's office. That city was never bombed. Professor uh, Well, I think there, <coughs> there are two things. The kind of momentum uh, the necessity to do the job is still going on. Uh, I'm thinking particularly of uh, the cloning controversy. I kind of agree with Senator Harkin. There are laboratories all over the world who are working on it, and I expect that we will be cloning human beings, probably wealthy human beings, uh, within our lifetime, because it can be done and because it's my job to do it. That's where my grant money comes from. Uh, on the other hand, we suffer also from bureaucratic inertia. Uh, we allowed Srebrenica to happen. We allowed uh, the decimation of the civilian population in Bosnia-Herzegovina uh, because we didn't want to do anything. Uh, we had the force. We didn't have the will, uh, possibly because we were afraid to use the force that we have because we know what happened when it is carried to an extreme as it was in Dresden. Uh, certainly, uh, those of us who went up to relieve the Bulge in the snow and the cold were awfully happy to see airplanes bombing the other side and we wouldn't have cared if they were bombing a civilian city. I remember after the war visiting Chemnitz uh, which was in the Russian zone. Seven blocks square in the center of Chemnitz had been reduced to rubble. The Russians had put up a large sign in German, of course, quoting Adolf Hitler saying, give me 10 years and you will not recognize Germany in front of that patch of rubble. Uh, I kind of agreed with them. Uh, I was happy to be out alive. <laughs> I wonder if I could follow up on your question with Mr. Vonnegut. If there's some parallel to the feelings that Kevin Herbert and William Styron had with the dropping of the atomic bomb. Uh, if you understand Professor Roder's feeling yeah. about, about the bombing of Dresden, that, that it had the same positive impact on him as it had on... All I, all I said as a reporter is what it looked like on the ground. Yes. Is I didn't say it shouldn't have happened. And I didn't say it should have happened. I'm just saying what it looked like yeah. on the ground. Okay. Uh, 
Mr. Bonnegut, uh, first I, I wish I could report, as my colleague from the Air Force Academy did uh, about Catch-22, that Slaughterhouse-Five was required re reading at West uh -huh. Point in 1970. Uh, it wasn't. We had our own literary firestorm. Uh, Captain Josiah Bunting had just published Lionheads. Uh, yeah. And it was a little bit controversial and at a, a place of 190 years of tradition, uh, unhampered sometimes by progress. It's hard to open the, open the mind to <laughs> contrary thoughts. I, I teach seniors here at Florida State University in the Army ROTC program. And uh, much to my chagrin, I, I would say, uh, I'm given one block of 75 minutes uh, that I am to teach a, uh, a lesson in the just war tradition. And anyone who has read your book and thought about war uh, knows that that sometimes doesn't ring true. Uh, 1,500 years of philosophers from St. Augustine and, and St. Thomas to, to the present have had a hard time uh, trying, to, trying to put something in writing. But uh, my job is faced with, with trying to uh, prepare young men and women to, to serve in a profession which is sometimes euphemistically called the controlled use of violence. For someone like yourself, who has written an experienced Dresden, is it possible, uh, do you think it's possible for a person who is educated and has an understanding of or thought about morality to embrace the concept of a just war? Or is the ability to do that uh, going to lead inevitably to a Dresden or Hiroshima or a mine? No, is I think we fought in, in a just war, and we're a rotten, spoiled generation. It's the class of 1922, 23, 24, because there have been practically no just wars in history. It's, and uh, I think it's so tragic uh, that so many of our young people were made to go fight in Vietnam when it, when even the people running it knew, <laughs> knew that it made no sense. No, we're rotten, spoiled. It's, it's, I wouldn't have missed World War II for anything. It was a great adventure. And people ask if, if I was deeply wounded by this experience. No, my character was formed by the dogs in my neighborhood in Indianapolis when I was 12 years old. Just some of them were scary, some of them were friendly and so forth. Dresden was just a great adventure for me. And uh, one time, when well, I was teaching, and uh, a girl said, you know, I've never seen a dead person. And I said, be patient. <laughs> I, uh, I think you're faced with a very difficult task. Uh, it would seem to me that uh, to, create, to create an effective fighting unit, you have to impress upon them the fact that they are not to think about what is right or what is wrong, or about the, the nature of the action they're in. The, the decisions to be made would be those of combat. Once you give individual servicemen to, the, the, the opportunity, encouragement to begin thinking critically, skeptically and morally about the action in which, they, in which they're involved, you're going to create hesitation, delay, and, and, and opposition within the unit itself. We're talking about literature of war today and listening uh, to, to Mr. Vonnegut and Mr. Steyer. Uh, I began trying to think of incidents I know about of servicemen who have refused to obey an order because they thought it was unjust. And with the exception of the man uh, who, who saved Paris, I'm not aware of any in, in our army, the British army, or any other army. The tendency at the time is to do what you're told. And I think in the RAF, the British airmen who are flying these night missions, they might have been frightened, they probably were frightened. But they were given orders, and they obeyed them because everybody surrounding them was obeying them as well. There is a human tendency to conform, even, even in our uh, uh, dissenting, even our dissenting ideologies. We, we, we're seldom alone. If, if I was opposed to the Vietnam War, I was surrounded by people who were opposed to it. It was not that I was living in a, a military city or, uh, in the Midwest or the South and, and standing out, although there were people who were doing it. Uh, we do tend to obey. And in the military, I think it becomes essential 
Uh, you can't give any service in the right to say, why are we doing this? Uh, and I was only going to add the footnote that I, I would agree with Joe uh, Heller that that it's a rare event indeed when uh, a military person uh, refuses to obey an order. The only one I can think of, uh, I, I wrote a review of a book uh, quite a few years ago, a book about the My Lai massacre. Uh, and the trial, it was called The Trial of, Lu of Lieutenant Kelly by a writer named Richard Hammer. And in the uh, detritus and the uh, accumulated detail of that hideous massacre where a horrid little second lieutenant with a machine gun and his friends massacred hundreds of innocent uh, villagers in in Vietnam, there is, stands out one lone private who simply said, I'm not going to do this. And it's an interesting thing because uh, he's forgotten. But his testimony was very wrenching because in the midst of all of this, uh, one of the sergeants who had been caught up in this lunacy, this incredible bloodlust, told him to shoot uh, a couple of children, and he, he, in his testimony, said, I ain't going to do it, and sat down and threw his rifle into a ditch and stoically sat there while the horror unfolded around him. And he's the uh, only hero of his kind that I know from the Vietnam War. I want to shift a little bit to a literary question. I'm sure I'm not the only person in this room who is surprised to hear that Slaughterhouse-Five was a piece of reportage. Um, I think it's, uh, it's also science fiction and fantasy and uh, postmodern. And I wondered if you would respond to the, the label that was placed on you very early that you were a postmodernist. Does that mean anything to you? And if so, what? And do you accept it as a label? Well, it, it's, it's taught by academics, and I, I don't hang around with academics that much. <laughs> uh, so, uh, right. but it's like the Moliere character, right? Who was told he was writing prose, and he was just thrilled. <laughs> 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 We've been talking a little about ideas of momentum and inertia, and it makes me think of two of the themes that um, I know are in your Slaughterhouse Five novel that I'm curious about: um, that of being unstuck in time, and also that of being like a bug stuck mm -hmm. in the amber of the moment. And I wonder if you could just elaborate on these ideas, um, both what they mean in the context of the novel, and also if they're if, if you might be able to apply them, maybe to us in today's society? Well, I, I have a quirky idea about our perception of the world, and I mean, I mean that's just because I've got a screw loose. Uh, <laughs> but I think what we are misunderstanding is time, is in every equation we treat time as a constant, and uh, I don't think it is, as I think time remains utterly mysterious and uh, but you take a risk if if, if you if you don't write sequentially it's, it, you don't do it either you don't you don't follow uh, one incident after another necessarily and uh, but my books are taught in high school sometimes slaughterhouse five and kids are having trouble reading you know, it's hard enough, it's just deciphering it, and then the, the fact that the events aren't following one after another sequentially is just too damn much. And, uh, I... Anyway, I, I'm, I'm, I had a friend who said my work had everything but originality, and, 
<laughs> I think it's true of anybody because the libraries are pretty full these days. Uh, but I, I think a lot of writers are now playing with time, as I think the suspicion I have that we don't, don't, don't understand it properly is, is widely shared. I wonder if I could uh, follow up on Janet's question, because I too think of Slaughterhouse-Five as a much more significant uh, intellectual event than reportage. And I wondered if perhaps um, you had um, a notion of therapy and solace, of uh, coping with uh, uh, for me, available yeah. phenomena sure. that, 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 that you, were, you were aiming for a purpose yeah. beyond just saying what the facts were. Right. Well, I, I, well it, I'm going to use an unfortunate word here, which is generally used in academies, but has unpleasant associations. It's when I wrote that book, I experienced catharsis. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good. Uh, we may come back to the panel again, but uh, we do want to take a little time to offer the audience a chance to ask Mr. Monaghan or any of the other members of the panel some questions. Uh, if there is anyone who wants to raise a question, we have a microphone here. Please, would you come to the microphone up there, please? Oh, yeah, we have one. This person. I wondered if um, the three authors could share with us any uh, recent books you've read that you thought were great. They don't have to be new books, but what you've read recently, the novels that you really enjoyed. What was the question? You, what books any, have you read that you might have enjoyed? Recent. Any works that you think they great? <laughs> Indeed, by Voltaire, and it's also very short. It won't take you very long. <laughs> Slaughterhouse Five by Kurt Vonnegut. <laughs> it isn't long enough. <laughs> I'm drawing a blank. I, I just, uh, uh, I, I um, this is one of those questions that stumps me utterly. I'm just always. hope, hope, always. Uh, Five minutes from now, I'll give you five, but at the moment, I can't do it, so... Uh. Would you, uh, uh, if I can report on a conversation uh, we had last night, uh, what about Moby Dick? Would, would, you, would you... Well, Moby Dick's a, a terrific book, but I haven't re read it in a number of years. I mean, <laughs> well, there is a terrific bestseller of recent times, which I liked a hell of a lot anyway, which was Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. I enjoyed that so much. That's and, not a novel. That's not a novel? No. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. <laughs> <laughs> I <bet. laughs> um, this doesn't pertain directly to your talk, uh, Mr. Vonnegut, but I was interested, all three of you, if any of you have any thoughts on the current uh, German treatment of uh, Scientologists and any possible, possibly disturbing historical parallels in that. What about Scientology? That misses uh, my... Well, we're not movie stars, and... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so, so we haven't gotten mixed up with Scientology, <laughs> and I don't think about it. <laughs> Thank you. Next question, please. <laughs> Hi. Um, my father was in the, in the military. He was in the Navy for about 30 years. Um, he was in World War II, and uh, he proceeded to go up through the ranks and performed a lot of different tasks. But uh, he was in a think tank while he was in the military called the Hudson Institute. And he was part of a group that decided whether or not we were going to go into Vietnam. And he said supposedly the most intelligent man in the United States at the time was speaking to, I assume, the National Security Council or something and was saying all the reasons why we should join the war. And my father stood up and said he was the only one who ever corrected him. And he said that, he stood up and said, um, the main reason that we should go into the war is because we haven't been in a conflict for about 10 years, and uh, it's something to do. We have the military, we need to build it up, we need to exercise, we need to participate in this conflict. And um, the man said, you are very right, that is the main reason why we should go into the war. And uh, I was wondering if you thought that there's any way for us to step beyond this mentality, this uh, bureaucratic mentality of just continuing to act like this. Do you think we can ever grow up as a civilization? 
Well, I, I think it's a form of entertainment now. Because I think almost everything that happens is, is a form of entertainment. And I think that we're learning to use military might in small ways and not get too hooked. As, as for instance, our arresting of, of Noriega, Manuel Noriega, the, the chief executive of Panama, of a sovereign nation. Uh, is, you know, we brought all our stuff in there, including the stealth bombers. We killed about 6,000 civilians, apparently, in the process of arresting him. But that was manageable. That was entertainment. It was show business. It was in and out. And I think there will be more and more uh, events like that that will justify the military life. As I, during the biggest disappointment in my lifetime, uh, really, is that the invisible bomber turned out not to be invisible. Uh, <laughs> as I thought on Air Force Day, we'd go out to the nearest air base or anything and walk around and all of a sudden, boink, and what was that? Well, like, <laughs> Next question, please. Mr. Vonnegut, let's just say that you, uh, it was your job to bomb America. Which of our great and ancient and cultured cities would you avoid? And would I be safe here in Tallahassee? Yeah. Yeah. No, I'd, I'd, I'd bomb the Atlanta airport, is what I would <laughs> Mr. Vonnegut. One metaphor that's not to like directly related to war, yet something that uh, Mr. Heller discussed that's present in your fiction, specifically in your first novel, is that of computers dehum dehumanizing humanity, to paraphrase Nietzsche. Um, I wonder if you could speak a bit to that. There seems to be a connection between computers and warfare. That, uh, well, of course they... When I was working for General Electric years ago, is they were trying, to, at the request of the Pentagon, they were trying to develop fully automatic schemes involving as few human beings as possible for knocking the hell out of the enemy. Uh, yeah, as I think... Uh, there's very little left for human beings to do, which, which is sort of demoral. I think that the Second World War and particularly the Holocaust, and then maybe the atomic bombings, disgusted us with being people. As I think it's very, uh, very seldom mentioned that, that uh, uh, we're awful animals if we can do that sort of thing. And so a lot of people think, well, yeah, the hell with it. Maybe we should. Maybe human life should end. And uh, I have, in my last brilliant book, which will be published in September, uh, <laughs> I say that the reason <clears throat> only a few people show up at anti-nuke rallies and uh, at uh, Greenpeace rallies and at uh, peace rallies, if there's any problem, is people don't give a damn if life goes on or not. They hate it. Mm -hmm. That they're embarrassed, they're too fat, their anchors are too thick, they can't dance, that they're not good lovers, they don't make enough money, uh, they're too short, is they, they just don't feel good. <laughs> So I think the secret is that people really don't like life very much. And uh, Dr. Strangelove is the end of it. Remember, is finally a doomsday advice goes off at the end. And there are these beautiful white clouds coming up. And uh, it's Glenn Miller Band playing We'll Meet Again, Don't Know Where, Don't Know When. I think that's what everybody liked about the movie, is we're all going to leave. <laughs> Thank you. Well, the question that I have about this period of the war is if the Allies were looking for targets and had bombs and needed something to do, why didn't they bomb the rail lines to the death camps? Well, because they would have killed Ellie Wiesel. <laughs> no, you see, they, uh, 
Well, they could have done that. It's very close to the beginning of the wars. Dresden, you know, was essentially a meaningless uh, gesture. Uh, I think probably about that time is Auschwitz itself yeah. it was under attack and, and was probably being evacuated. Also, there was an extreme difficulty. When I was writing uh, Sophie's Choice, I, I did some research on that. And uh, on the surface, it appeared very easy to have been able to do that. But in actual fact, the rail lines uh, uh, heading into the camp were situated such that uh, it would have, could have easily caused uh, a, a terrible damage to uh, an injury to the, to the inmates, uh, to, the, to the people who were, who were already victimized. And uh, as a matter of fact, there, was, there are documents from the Pentagon uh, that were made public uh, quite some time ago uh, showing that this was considered as an option uh, but the reason against it was, uh, just as I said, uh, that, that uh, it was not feasible because they were worried it would cause uh, more injury to uh, the, the people who were in Auschwitz than would justify any such bombing. Question, please? Yeah, I feel a little like a supplicant kneeling in the hallway here. <laughs> but if I ever had a chance to actually see Kurt Vonnegut and ask him one question, I thought it would be the second dumbest one here today. And that is, are you the reincarnation of Mark Twain? And if, <laughs> if not, how come? No, this is, this is, my, this is my father's mustache. <laughs> 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 yes, please. Literary question again um, to all the guests if they could answer this one. Uh, when you're dead and gone, many decades from now, um, what would you hope to be your literary legacy? Who are you asking? All three of you, if you wouldn't mind. What Thank would you. hope to be the literary legacy? Yeah, would, all right, if, if I could leave one book of my, of my hundreds. Uh, I'd rather leave Cat's Cradle than any other book. Which one of your books would you leave? What was the question? You can only, <laughs> if you, you can only be survived by one book. What book is it going to be? Your book. I don't think in those terms. Uh, when life ends for me, it ends, and I, I don't much care about my reputation. <laughs> Yes, sir. <laughs> uh, Mr. Tyler, do you want to? I, I feel very much the same way. I don't think it's an answerable question. I, I'm uh, uh, writing for me has been such a difficult process over <clears throat> the years I've been work that I'm very pleased to have. I mean, exhaustedly and relievedly pleased to have produced what I have produced, and uh, each of my works has. Uh, I, I can see in retrospect terrible flaws and considerable virtues um, and I, I uh, would not assign any particular scale of values to any particular one. I just think that I would hope that, uh, that, that the virtues outweigh the flaws and that they're all read sometime after I go to the <clears throat> great writer's colony in the sky. Uh, I'd like to touch on an aspect of, uh, of Bill's remark, uh, uh, and that is something most people don't realize. Writing novels is not easy. It's very hard work. It grows harder the older you get, and unlike other professions, it does not grow easier with experience. Oh, my, my. Okay. Question, please. Okay. I, one thing to say about our profession, though, is James McNeil Whistler, the American painter who worked mostly in England, said one time, if you want to see envy, go among the painters. This is not true of novelists, by and large. Is I, just as soldiers feel brothers to all other soldiers, I think writers uh, feel a close relative of anybody who's completed a book, with, even whether it's been it's published so or not. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. please. All three guests wrote in the aftermath of a just war, World War II. How do you feel, this is for all three of you guys, 
How do you feel contemporary authors, such as uh, like Tim O'Brien, you touched on, Mr. Styron, on uh, the trial of Lieutenant Callie, which Mr. O'Brien touched on in his novel In the Lake of the Woods. How do you feel contemporary authors have handled reality and metaphor in the aftermath of an unjust war, Vietnam? Thank you. Well, I think uh, you, you spoke of Tim O'Brien. I think, uh, m in my limited view, I, I, I don't have an overview of uh, all the literature uh, that has come out of the uh, Vietnam War. Uh, I think Tim O'Brien is probably the outstanding uh, novelist to have come out of that war. His uh, hatred and loathing of, of the war is so complete. Uh, he's very eloquent <coughs> in making that hatred and loathing manifest on the page. Uh, I would say, however, uh, that there are two books uh, so far. I don't know if there will be any others because time is running out. I wouldn't uh, foreclose the uh, time yet, but uh, the Vietnam veterans are getting older and uh, I don't see any new Vietnam literature on the horizon. But uh, I would say that, uh, barring some masterpiece, that the Vietnam War was best expressed by two works of nonfiction. One called A Rumor of War by Philip Caputo, which is a brilliant uh, personal account of uh, his own participation in the war, a harrowing account of all the various things he had to do, including uh, committing some atrocities. And the other one is uh, a marvelous book called Dispatches by Michael Herr, H-E-R-R, uh, which is brilliant. Um, the uh, movie uh, Full Metal Jacket was uh, partially based on, on that, uh, that work. And I highly recommend uh, uh, both books to anyone who really wants to know the nitty gritty and the ugly underside of the Vietnam War. Yes, please. Thank you. This is for uh, Mr. Vonnegut. Um, in your book, Slaughterhouse-Five, you use uh, the saying, so it goes, over and over. Is this your view on life? Well, uh, it's, it's best if you don't go all to pieces every time something bad happens. Uh, <laughs> and so, uh, yeah, it was dismissed. Dismissed. The way George Roy Hill handled this in the movie, incidentally, is very interesting. It's when they decided to make a movie out of it. They thought maybe some voice over God or somebody was going to say, so it goes, or maybe some character would say it. And uh, then the way they did it, it's as soon as somebody died, just horribly often, cut to another scene, utterly unrelated. There was never any time to mourn the death of anybody, which is, in fact, the case in wartime. <clears throat> Yes, please, your question. Uh, this is for Mr. Vonnegut. Um, concerning your theme of the inhumanity of man's inventions to man and um, basically man's own ability to destroy himself, where do you see mankind heading in the 21st century, well after you're gone? Thanks a lot. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> I didn't mean to imply that you're going to die by the time the 21st century. <laughs> I don't know. It's, I, I, again, it's, it's, my interest is, has been largely in technology and, and, and in the state of the planet as a survival system. And there have been complaints that, that, these, you know, that this, these aren't proper subjects for a novel. Uh, but I think overpopulation is really going to give us a hell of a lot of trouble and, and we've done an awful lot of damage to the environment and so forth. Uh, so I'd say the news is going to be bad uh, just because it's going to be so much harder for human beings to survive uh, and eat. So the news is bad is Isaac Asimov, the late Isaac Asimov, uh, I was at a symposium like this with people like us sitting in front of the audience. And, uh, but somebody asked Asimov how long the planet had to go. He was a biochemist, of course, a very capable scientist as well as a great science fiction writer. And he said, Earth, air, fire, or, Earth, air, or water. 
And so somebody else said, all of them. So I said, so many years for topsoil, so many years for air, so many years for water. This is chilling. <laughs> and the guy knows what he's doing. Actually, I think we're going to get hit by a meteor. <laughs> I've read probably just about everything you've ever published, but the one story that stuck in my mind over the years the most, and I can't remember the title of it, was a short story in your collection of short stories called Welcome to the Monkey House. And in this story, the protagonist is a very talented ballet dancer who is weighted down with weights yeah. so that his performance does not outshine anyone else's. Could you comment how this relates to the current dumbing down of America? and the doctrine of the quality of outcome as opposed to the quality of opportunity? Well, William Buckley liked that story a lot. Because, and <laughs> at one point I was completely out of print except in the National Review that month. <laughs> and the Wall Street Journal published the story. It was called Harrison Bergeron and it was where there had been amendments to the Constitution so that uh, none of the citizens feel like something the cat drug in because they were too ugly or too slow or whatever. And so everybody, if you were beautiful, you had to wear a rubber, a rubber ball for a nose. And if you were too graceful, you had to wear sash weights tanked around your ankles and so forth. And the name of the story was Harrison Bergeron. And uh, I was just commenting on high school. <laughs> <laughs> So I'd like to address this question to the, uh, to the whole panel there. Carrying on with this, this, this uh, theme of the kind of inexorable movement of the, of the war bureaucracy, what were some of y'all's thoughts when the uh, Persian Gulf War was coming to a head there? I think, once again, that was a war that was declared a just war, at least by Billy Graham. I don't know if it, the Pope was declared. <laughs> but it was, it was a, a real feel-good war on, for the country as a whole. But I was wondering what y'all's thoughts were. When you, what? Uh, what do you think, think of the uh, Desert Storm? The Gulf War. Me. Yeah, they said Mr. Heller. What? <laughs> <laughs> I felt I felt about that war the same way, even more intense war than I felt about our previous wars, Vietnam uh, and the uh, and Korean War. Uh, in my aversion to it was based largely on my inability to be convinced by national spokesmen that there was any reason to go to that war, any convincing reason. I found every explanation uh, unbelievable and incredible, and consequently, since I thought they were lying or they did not know what they were talking about, uh, I could see no justice for that action taking place. One of the th remarks I, I did make at the time was that George Bush doesn't know why we're going to war. And I didn't know. If he, if he knew, he would tell us. Yes, I agree with you. Did you want to comment? Well, it's just war is entertainment, again, and, and to draw attention to George Bush and to uh, our Army and Navy and Air Force. But again, it was manageable. We weren't going to get into really bad trouble again. And another appalling thing about it was that it was another undeclared war. He determined to go to war without seeking the approval of Congress or Senate, so a declaration of war uh, became, became superfluous. Your question, please? Okay, Kurt Vonnegut, please. If you were Howard S. Campbell, would you, uh, would you rather be with Rezi Noth or Helga Noth for the rest of your life? That's a very friendly question. I think most people don't know what it's about. It's about my novel, uh, Mother Night, uh, which has been made into a movie played by Nick Nolte and Alan Arkin and John Goodman. Anyway, uh, I don't know. Who would I rather be? Is I, I don't know, but thank you. <laughs> you got a question, please? Hi, Kurt. How you doing? Um, I know you so well. Um, this question is about Howard Campbell, too, actually. Um, and you... He's in Mother Night, and you bring him back in Slaughterhouse-Five, and I was curious to know if he was based on anyone and if there was actually any attempts to recruit Americans for the German army. Yeah, there was. Uh, 
before the bombing at Dresden, and uh, this guy showed up and uh, uh, claimed he was from the Free American, from the Free America Corps, right? He would, and uh, he had a really swell proposition: is our real enemies were the communists, and uh, so we sh we sh we should join an American unit on the Russian front and fight the communists. Which was a swell idea, I think. And then after the communists were defeated, we'd be repatriated through Switzerland. And the uh, promise, which was really quite tempting, is warmth and food, you know. And, and so that might be one reason to join. But nobody joined the Free America Corps, but there was another outfit called the Knights of St. George. And of course, you realize the Brits had been in prison for years often, caught early on at... Uh, during uh, the Battle of France, and uh, they were sort of nutty, and some guys did join the Knights of St. George, I understand. And the French, of course, had a, uh, uh, had a whole regiment, had a whole regiment, I think, on the Russian front. Uh, no, but nobody joined the Free America Corps, but there was such a thing. Um, you gentlemen all took part in what you call a, a just war. I'm wondering if you think uh, that the future, uh, in the future, there might be a, a just war. And if so, uh, do you think it will be fought in the name of uh, uh, a multinational corporation or religion or some charismatic individual like yourselves or, or just whom? <laughs> you guess. I don't know. Uh, my, my personal reaction to World War II as a just war is based on the fact that we were not actively involved in it until we were attacked at Pearl Harbor. And a day or so later, Germany and Italy declared war on the U.S. before the U.S. declared war on them. So that, f from my point of view, it was a defensive war and a necessary war as an alternative to surrender. I know of no other war since it that had those uh, characteristics. I can't think of any American wars preceding it that had those characteristics. Yes, please, your question. You mentioned earlier in the earlier speech today that Jefferson and the Founding Fathers relied on us to be good citizens and decent. What do you think caused this decline in decency and also what happened in the world that enabled us to be capable of such grand scale inhumanity as in World War II? Well, I, I think they had a manageable little society there and of their own kind, and, and uh, so you could expect decency. I don't know what the whole population of the United States was then, but uh, not very many people and, and uh, with very similar views. And I mean, it's ridiculous to try to belong to something as big as the United States, for God's sake. You know, it can't be done. It's everybody and everything is here. Uh, one thing, the United States is so big that we can have wars going on someplace, you know, like Los Angeles. We don't even have to acknowledge it. Uh, but I, I, yeah, it, it's Jefferson and Madison and Washington and Benjamin Franklin belong to a folk society and no such things exist anymore. I actually want to follow up on that previous question <clears throat> because a phrase that occurred this morning has been rattling around in my head, freedom without responsibility. It seems to me that you have been documenting, especially in World War II, just war or not, that technology gave us the freedom to do whatever we wanted, Germany, uh, Japanese, us, and we did it. And that has created a society of victims and victims don't have any morality. Do you have any comment about that? Yeah, I, I, well, I think war has always been bad for us, and I think it all dehumanizes us, even without new technologies. But I, yeah, well, what is really on my mind is new technologies all the time and what they're doing. And what I say uh, about the computer age, is they're just trying to knock everybody down to minimum wage 
<laughs> they wouldn't be investing all the money in these damn things. And, and, of course, everybody has to buy a computer now the way they all had to buy a TV set. And it's like in, in inviting you to dig your own graves, you know. Uh, and I've said, too, that it used to be that a man or a person who got into some sort of trouble and, and lost a job, we used to say he had his head hand, handed to him on a platter. Well, now people are getting their heads handed to them with tweezers, <laughs> microchips. Uh, our uh, panelists are going to be going to a press conference, so I think they've labored long and hard and well for us, and so I want to uh, terminate our session now and thank them for their participation.